Welcome to Smarter Impact. My name is Philip Bateman. I'm your host, and I'm excited to be bringing you this next in our series of collaborations with Pro Bono Australia. We're going to be talking to Andy McCarthy, the CEO of RACV Solar, and looking at the profound opportunity from a consumer and an investor perspective that represents the transformation of energy that is happening inside Australia and the world. Due to COVID-19, this was a pre-recorded interview that was done before restrictions were put in place. Andy, we were having a chat on the way over about the basically the culture you're creating amongst your employees and the difference between using third-party contractors and your own people. You're talking about making them accountable for essentially customer service and having uh, toolbox talks. What kind of stuff do you do in your organization in a cultural sense to bring people together and to get the best out of your people? Well, I think at the end of the day, surrounding yourself with the right people, investing in those people and, and giving them a sense of ownership over where the business is going and the journey that we're on, uh, I feel like that's the key to our success. And it's a bit of a cliche because every business says that, but I, I really believe in my bones that we practice it and it's part of our DNA and, and it always has been and always will be. Um, the hardest thing for any business owner is when you start a business like we did, my wife and I, Kelly, in our third bedroom in a little town in regional Victoria, we, we were the business. So you would call the phone number for Gippsland Solar I would answer, I'd give them the customer experience, put a proposal together, and then I'd load the trailer and jump on the roof and do the installation and pull the tennis balls out of the gutter and do all those little things to improve that experience for them. And then I'd do all the paperwork afterwards and follow up and say, is there anything we can improve next time? So you know exactly what your experience uh, for your clients is like because you control every element of it. And uh, like a lot of businesses, as we've grown rapidly, I've had to learn to hand over components of the business that I wanted to control myself and really look after that client. And so finding those people that will believe in the vision, that have the same passion that I do for looking after the client, it's been, um, you know, we've had our ups and downs along the way and we've, um, we've had some staff that haven't worked out, but, but we've kept our entire team basically intact for the last five years. Mm. And um, I know that my team is so invested in where we're going. They believe in what we're doing, our mission. They know that we're doing a great job by our clients uh, in an industry that's probably had a trust deficit, I think it's fair to say, over the last 10 years. Um, we believe that we're a force for good in the industry and our staff have got behind that. And when you're all pulling in that same direction, then the rest of the business all just clicks in my opinion. And what is your mission? Our mission is to um, you know, get as many uh, households working off solar and battery storage as we can. You know, so we're out here in Western Melbourne at the moment. Um, I'm just looking around some of these factory roofs and to give you an idea of the scale, for a business that started in our third bedroom and you know, did 10 panels for you know, Joe and Mary every yeah. second week, um, to now stand on this roof here uh, in Derrimut in Melbourne and I look behind us and we installed a 100 kilowatt system. We're standing on a roof where we've just installed another 200 kilowatts and my team's actually just over there out of camera installing another 200 kilowatts um, next door as well. So to see the um, you know 1200 solar panels installed over a small area and to think that we've created that and putting a significant dent in the energy load profile of the of this um, suburb, mm. it's, it's a tremendous feeling, it really is. And I. I get so excited. I think we were just saying before the interview started that I, I don't look at the roofs with solar. I look at all the ones that don't have solar and I'm like, why is that? Does that client not know that they could be lowering their electricity bills, improving their environmental credentials and future-proofing their business with solar? Uh, is it because they don't own the factory even though they don't realize there's a solution um, for businesses that lease their premises? Is it because they don't have the capital with interest rates being low, that's never been easy to overcome? I just get to that point where I look around and I look at the roofs that don't have solar and I think, why not? And yeah. I think that shows us where we still have to go, even though I'm excited about what we've achieved. Yeah. There's still more to do, a lot more to do. Yeah. And in that regard as well, it makes me think of the environmental, sort of the environmental debate in Australia, because I know a lot of people feel upset about the sort of the political stance on things. Though I believe we are one of the biggest installers of residential solar of anywhere in the world. Is that the case? Yeah, we do have the largest uptake of rooftop solar in the world per capita. Um, so I think there's 2 million houses now in Australia have solar. Um, so that's a great start. Uh, I have to say, in my opinion, it's been done in spite of any leadership at a federal level um, politically. You know, we've been very fortunate in Victoria to have a state government that really does back renewables wholeheartedly, really believes in where we're going and setting targets and hitting those targets ahead of time. Um, that, that certainty, it's not about subsidies or propping up an industry, it's about policy certainty. And we're talking to international investors wanting to build solar farms. They don't need incentives or financial um, you know, price reductions or anything, they just need investment certainty because they're putting a um, system out there in a field that's going to be returning for the next 15 or 20 or 25 years. 
I don't think anyone knows what our policy landscape is going to look like in 15 years. So it makes it very hard to be writing significant checks when you don't know what the policy landscape is going to look like in the future. And when you talk about investment certainty, are you referring to, say, renewable energy credits or that sort of thing, like carbon pricing? What, what certainty is it that these people lack? Well, I think there's a real uncertainty about what the energy mix is going to look like in Australia. So I don't think anyone would have expected that we'd be sitting where we are now. Like in 2020, we're going to see a 6% increase in, in the national grid uh, for the percentage of renewable energy. So to increase our percentage of renewables across the country by 6% in a year, uh, even the most ambitious person like I'd consider myself, I don't think we expected that in one year we'd see that much increase. It's it's monumental. It's a permanent you know, structural shift in the energy market. but. What that's doing, all these renewables coming online, we're already seeing that in 2021, 22 and 23, mm. the wholesale price of electricity in the spot in the spot market is going from $70 down to 65 and then eventually down towards $50 a megawatt hour in 2023. Now, that's actually making some of our large scale renewable energy projects um, almost unviable commercially against the wholesale price of electricity. Mm. Um, and so you can imagine what that's doing to these yeah. coal fired power stations with you know significant requirement for maintenance, uh, a lot of capital needs to be put into these, and these are privately owned power stations. So we, we don't have the ability to say you need to stay open for the interests of the, um, the local economy or employment sector. If they're not commercially viable, mm. they'll shut down. And I believe they'll shut down quicker than anyone realises. And I think that's something that we need to be aware of is what the lowering price of electricity is going to do to all forms of generation. Mm. We're poised on for this tremendous transition. Um, what would surprise people about this transition? You know, what are the opportunities for those who want to lead for the next 10, 20 and 50 years? I think there's still a lack of recognition about not just the amount of employment that, that the renewable energy industry can offer, but the types of jobs. So, I mean, everyone knows that, you know, first year apprentice can get a job installing solar panels on a roof. Um, but I don't think that we are thinking laterally enough and thinking about all of those supply chain jobs. You know, there's a, a large amount of work that goes into finance of solar projects now. A lot of businesses and, and residents even, they're not capitalising these and paying out of their, out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. They're using the savings from the system to pay it off over a period of five or seven or ten years. And, you know, in the, in the case like a power purchase agreement, which is becoming increasingly popular, um, a PPA is a situation where you don't actually pay for the solar panels that are on this roof. Yeah, we install it, uh, the PPA provider finances it, um, and, and so we get paid up front, but the consumer just buys the energy per kilowatt hour for everything that the system generates. So we install a separate meter. Um, every um, three or six months, we, we um, run a report to say this is what the system's generated. So you obviously weren't buying that from the grid for 19 or 20 or 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and then typically you're paying around 10, 11 or 12 cents per kilowatt hour for the energy that the system produces. Um, the beauty of that is that there's no um, outlay for the client. If it doesn't produce anything, then they don't pay. So it's the ultimate performance guarantee. Um, and it spreads the savings over a longer period of time so that you you know, you're going to get a long-term benefit over the next 10 or 15 years as well. So the market's really maturing. Uh, and with that is creating a whole bunch of these other white collar roles. We've also now in our workforce of 80 odd staff, uh, we have um, uh, two electrical engineers, um, two that are about to graduate their electrical engineer um, degrees as well. Uh, we have uh, drone pilots who are flying around building 3D models of really complex sites and running um, shade path analysis and sun simulations and things like that. Um, you know, our business employees, you know, we're very gender diverse. We, we have, I think, 18 nationalities employed across our workforce of 80 staff. Uh, we've created opportunities for Indigenous apprenticeships as well in East Kippsland. So um, these jobs are across all sectors of the community. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's some high paying jobs as well as some low paying ones as well. Um, there's some highly skilled work in there. Um, some of the highest paid people in the power industry are now working in our business and taking some of those skills that they created in the Latrobe Valley, uh, transferring their cost to renewables. Um, because the, at the end of the day, we see ourselves as an electricity generator. And, and I think once we start to see ourselves as a generator, the same way as a coal fired power station is, or a pumped hydro facility or a wind farm, then I think that we understand that we all have a common goal. Um, and a lot of those jobs are actually more transferable than what people would realise. Mm. And the software layer underneath all of this, I was involved in the feasibility studies for the LO3 uh, microgrid project oh, yeah. out, um, or at least promoting it. And uh, it's just an amazing time. I mean, it's power, it's digital. What do you see, um, you know, personal power grids and sort of microgrids and energy, com energy communities, basically, people taking control of their own sharing and things like that? Is it really just a financial play on top of 
you know, moving balances around or is there actually strength in taking control of people's energy? I don't know how long we have this interview because once you get me talking on this stuff, I'll never stop. It's, it, it's been a passion of mine now for so long. Like I've just been really excited and not just the projects that we're delivering, which obviously I'm very proud of, but what the industry is doing. You know, we, we're, we're smashing records, making and breaking records every week, delivering things that have never been done before. We've just turned the switch on a, um, a 60 kilowatt system on an apartment block in, uh, in Preston, uh, in the suburbs of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, had some support from state government and a few other providers as well. And so what that was, was a 60 kilowatt solar array with 54 kilowatt hours of battery storage on the roof of the apartment block, but technology that allows that solar to be um, spread across the 54 apartments. Mm -hmm. So basically um, all of these apartments are getting an equal benefit from the solar and battery storage. Mm -hmm. We ran something like 1.2 kilometers of uh, cable, you know, to try and distribute the energy across the different meters. Yeah. But what we're seeing now is that a single solar system on an apartment roof in a social housing situation can benefit all 54 tenants and mm. if one of the tenants for example was using more electricity from solar and battery storage um, than in the others mm. uh, on the second day of the month uh, then the system would equalize so by the end of the month everyone got 1 54th of that benefit right. and uh, it's 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 remarkable because we yeah. we see these things and Can we hear it? about them yeah that's yeah. right and we're not only doing things technologically that have never been done before, mm. but we're using it to benefit people that need the support the most. Mm. And I mm. believe the next step is find ways to, to get a hold of the people in society that aren't able to pay their bills and say, you can benefit from this technology as well. It, it's not as easy because they don't own, you know, 2000 meters of factory roof, mm. but there are ways that it can be done. And if we don't start focusing on that, then we're just going to widen the gap and we're not going to be solving the problem that we're here to solve. So when these prices spike, and the solar can respond quicker than the traditional coal burners to the inflated spot price demand. Are all the renewables picking up the profit margin? Well, they can do. Not, not necessarily with solar, but with right. a battery. Yeah. So that's what we're seeing with the big battery in South Australia, for example. Yeah. A lot of their revenue is called you know, FCAS revenue, so frequency control. So basically, when there's a huge demand on the grid, so let's say... Um, like when everybody turns the kettle on and the break at neighbours in England. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> the energy exactly. Grid goes, boof. And for us, it might be the third week in February at 4.30 in the afternoon when all the PlayStations are running at home because the kids are home from school, the air conditions are on, people are starting to come home from work mm. um, and it's 38 degrees in the shade and we see a tremendous <laughs> impact on the grid. So the grid consumption in Victoria might be 9,000 megawatts or something like that. Mm. So when there's an over demand and lack of supply, the price goes up. Yeah. Uh, and the technology that can respond the fastest, which is in this case, battery storage, mm. it may take a gas turbine, to, uh, you know, one and a half to two hours to really capture that um, opportunity and feed into the grid. Mm. And batteries, as, as we've seen in South Australia, they can do that within a, you know, a 17th of a second. Whoever gets in first picks up the income. Yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense. And in the UK, they did actually have some projects at the start when this, um, the FCAS market was highly um, profitable. Some companies were getting a 12, 18 month return on their investment. And then as more supply came into the market, those revenue opportunities became less and less. Mm. And there were some projects where they'd done a certain set of numbers and said, we can generate this much revenue from the battery per year. By the time they got the system online and commissioned into the grid, that revenue opportunity was significantly watered down. Yeah. So it's a tremendously dynamic market, but people who understand it and have the courage to try and capture these opportunities mm. are going to be the ones that are successful and renewables are the only way to do that. Yeah. The things that we can achieve uh, are, are quite remarkable at the moment. The, te the technology exists, it can all be done. A lot of the time it's really the legislative framework that needs to change. In terms of peer-to-peer -peer trading, there's no reason why it can't be done now except that the policy and the regulation settings aren't there to allow it. Yeah, and you know, turning your fridge, running your fridge with solars, great. Turning your microwave on, running your TV. But what's more fun is driving down the road. So, electric vehicles. Yes. I know we, um, I already mentioned SEA Electric. And I know Tim Washington and Jet Charge, head of the EV council, just landed a deal with Porsche. I'm a huge Tesla fan, you drive one. And this stuff isn't new, you know, Toyota Camry hybrids go like a rocket sled and they've been at it like 10 years now, it mm. feels like. Um, how will vehicle to grid play a role in building network resilience? Well, I think this is one of the great opportunities that we are still yet to realize. People like Tim, of course, would know that. He's one of the most innovative people in the industry. He's driving an entire sector in a lot of ways, a lot of respect for what he's done. And um, he understands the opportunity to, you know, um, capture the electrification of the vehicle market mm. and use that to further increase the penetration of renewables. Mm. So I get a lot of different resistance in the Latrobe Valley, which is where I'm from. And um, some of it is around, well, what happens when there's too much renewable energy? 
because you're going to be going into the negative during the day. Really? That's yeah. a question. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, that those same people back in 2010 would have said it's all a bunch of rubbish and it will never work yeah. and never take off. And but now we're talking. The answer, you just don't use it or you store it. Well, that's right. Yeah. So they've gone from saying that it won't make a difference yeah. to the grid to saying, it, well, now there's too much yeah, impact it comes on the off grid. These things behind us. Yeah. That's they just right. sit there. <laughs> so now we've demonstrated that we can actually have negative, actual negative net demand on a particular feeder in the network. Yeah. So more solar being produced than what an entire neighbourhood running off that feeder is actually mm -hmm. using, which is, I think, quite incredible in itself. Yeah. Uh, but the next step is when we do have those excess renewables washing through the market, we can, ever, we can either turn off the solar system, which is really dumb in my opinion, or we can start using things like battery storage, i.e. electric vehicles, to capture that. Ah, oh, because the cars are batteries. That's right. So it's a 100 just... kilowatt hour battery. Right. And what I don't think a lot of consumers would understand is that if you buy an electric vehicle and then you put solar on the roof, that's all well and good. But most people drive to work and then park the car at work between sunlight hours yeah so what we would like to see is more of a push towards filling up some of these business rooftops with solar which is where the cars are parked during the day mm. so let's say you've got a tesla battery uh, a tesla electric vehicle with 100 kilowatt hours of storage you park in an electric vehicle parking bay with um, 25 other evs and then you have software that just feeds a little bit of that renewable energy coming off the roof of the business into each of the evs so at the end of the day when they all leave at 5 p.m they're all full with 100 kilowatt hours each then they drive home yeah. and then they plug in their car into the house and then they use their 100 kilowatts of their battery energy to run their house. Ah. Yes. Ah, so you charge your battery. Beautiful. Charge yeah. a car during the day, then move it home, power your stuff overnight. Absolutely. So you technically don't even need a battery system at home then if your car's the mobile battery. I think a combination of both will be the yeah. way we're going. Um, but I would think that, that most people would be driving to work all day, parking there during sunlight hours. So yeah. I think that's going to play a significant role. And really that software and technology is really available now anyway. It can be done. Uh, again, it's more the policy and regulation settings that are holding us back. So yeah. a little bit more courage and a bit more innovation at a political level. And I think we can really start to realize these opportunities. Mm. Your foundation or a, your triple bottom line, what would you say to that? Well, I think that's been a part of the DNA of our business since day one. Mm. Um, we started as a husband and wife team and um, you know we got to do all the things that we're passionate about. We had a couple of goals in the business. One was to build uh, a successful business that was profitable and sustainable and had a nice even stream of work flowing in to be able to allow us to employ some great people in regional Victoria, which five years later we could sit back and say, tick, we're really happy with how we're going. Yeah. Uh, and then we sat down and had a bit of a meeting and, and said, well, what do we want to be known for? Mm. Um, the, you know, we were so consumed with trying to build the business that we hadn't really thought about what happens when we do get to the point where we're pretty sustainable mm. and then we have to start thinking about our legacy. Um, so we started putting a percentage of revenue into the, the Gippsland Solar Community Fund um, and, and we were able to do some fantastic work. So we've donated solar systems for um, wildlife shelters um, and floating art galleries um, and uh, we did some work with Fair Share mm. who do a lot of work. I think they produce about one and a half million meals a year for people in need. Um, you know, I, I could just go on and on about some of the things we've done because I'm so proud of, of all those types of things. But it, especially in the Latrobe Valley where we hail from it, it doesn't just tell a great story about us supporting the community in our business, but it talks about how renewable energy can play a part in this, you know, transition. Mm. And not only can it provide uh, bill relief for organisations doing incredible work, but it actually shows that renewables are the way that everyone's going. Mm. And you know, th this industry is transitioning. And if I put my Latrobe Valley hat on, I always say that, you know, whether we like it or not in the Latrobe Valley, the transition's happening. You had to build a coal-fired power station, basically where the coal resource was. That's that's why you build it there. Yeah. But the sun shines everywhere, and there's a lot of places that it shines a lot more than the Latrobe Valley. So we don't have that competitive advantage. Oh. So for me, we need to start being more proactive and saying, well, we don't get to decide if the industry transitions to renewable energy. It just is going to. Yeah. And if you look at the worm in the last 10 years, we've gone from you know 3% renewables to 31% in a very short period of time. Mm. It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to work out where it's going from there. Yeah. Um, but the Latrobe Valley, the Latrobe Valley, I believe, sits in a great opportunity to capture some of that. You know, like, are you the figureheads for all this, or is this happening nationwide? Is everybody got a valley that where the renewable energy transition is going on? Well, I think uh, it's a lot easier for a region to embrace the transition to renewables when um, they weren't producing, you know, the previous iteration of energy, and they didn't have as much to lose. Yeah. So there has been a sense in the Latrobe Valley of being dragged, kicking and screaming at this transition. I think it's fair to say. Mm. In 2010, when we started our business in the valley, it was the worst place in Australia to start a renewable energy company. There's no doubt about that. The, the council weren't supportive. The community was largely unsupportive. Um, and 
you know, it's understandable because for the last 60 or 70 years, that is all they've ever known. You've had politicians campaigning to be elected based on reopening power stations from memory. Absolutely. And we still do. We still do. Uh, And I just, it blows me away that people are still trying to campaign on that platform when you just need to follow the money. If you follow the money in any industry, it does not take much to work out where it's going. And I think what we're showing now is the the, the closure of Hazelwood was a tremendous shock to our region in the Latrobe Valley. Like it, there was people having um, protests five days before the power station closed. They're already draining the fluids and doing all the decommissioning. And there's a protest saying, keep our power station open. At, at that point, I'm saying, let's not talk about Hazelwood because that's already been shut down. Mm. Let's talk about your lawn, W station, which is due to close in 2025 or 2030, whenever it may be, yeah. also privately owned. So when the economics don't stack up, it's very hard to justify keeping it open. So we say to people, like, let's think about what's the next Hazelwood and let's not let ourselves get in that position. Let's start planning three years out and giving these these employees some pathways mm. so that we're not just left with a rug put out from under us going, what do we do now? So I think it was about six weeks ago I saw there was a shareholder movement at Chevron where more than 50 or 60% of the shareholder base turned around and said we need to basically transition the whole way the business works. They didn't get it successfully put through due to some veto powers of those sitting on the board. Mm. But it was pretty, you know, 60% of the shareholder base turned around to the biggest oil company on the world and went, right, we're not doing fossil fuels anymore. Yeah. So, right. And it's the same with superannuation funds. Mm. And as I said, you know, I, I believe when renewable energy was more expensive than other traditional forms of energy, people were still prepared to embrace it. Now that it's cheaper, significantly cheaper, mm. I don't even understand why we're still having this argument. I, I just don't get it. I still see people out there, people that have um, responsible roles in the community, arguing that renewable energy is the cheapest form of electricity. It's, it's not even an opinion, it's just, it's just data. Mm. So we just, we just need to move past that and accept that it's already the cheapest form of energy. Even solar with battery storage. In India, there was a, um, a tender that went out for dispatchable 24 hour energy. Yeah. Um, and, and solar and battery storage was the cheapest form of energy 24 hours a day, including the cost of firming it with battery storage. Mm. Once we hit that point, dispatchable 24 hours a day renewable energy, the game's over. Mm. The, te- the technology has won and we need to get on board and embrace it. Mm. What's been your biggest failure? Uh, I'm very opinionated. <laughs> I've, 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 <laughs> I, All right, then what did you say to who? <laughs> oh, look, I think when I moved from um, the inner green belt of Melbourne to the Latrobe Valley in 2010, so I married a Gippsland girl from the Latrobe Valley. And, um, wow, and you were in the green corridor of like Fitzroy Carlton. I was, yep, Ooh. yep. I lived in Thornbury. So yeah. your environmentalism was your badge of honour. Yeah. And so I moved down there with the way that I think the world needs to be. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved living in my echo chamber where we all agreed that renewable energy was the future. Um, and, and in hindsight, I moved to the Latrobe Valley with this, I believe so firmly in the way things need to go. Mm. And, and I, I got really frustrated when people couldn't see that uh, or, or were spouting facts that I just didn't, I didn't think were right and I thought they were misleading. Um, I was very outspoken at the start. And, and I had to actually sit back and go, well, hang on a minute. So my best friend, he's just uh, bought a house just out of the Latrobe Valley there. He works at Hazelwood. Mm. You know, he's highly leveraged with a mortgage now. He's worked in that sector now for 10 years. His dad worked in there for 50 years. Mm. And now you've got some smart aleck coming up from the inner green belt in Melbourne telling him, forget about coal, you know, renewables yeah. of the future. And I was way too belligerent in my putting my opinions forward. Yeah. And I, so I needed to sit back and actually look around and imagine from their perspective, mm. uh, you know, just understanding why they're not embracing renewable energy um, and, and really coming around to their way of thinking. So I think that the Valley has, has embraced renewables in a certain way and and sort of come to that middle ground but i think people like myself have also had to find that middle ground as well and realize that we're talking about people's careers talking about legacy and family history and all those things that mean a hell of a lot to people and then they see the stacks coming down and they see people coming down from melbourne and having big parties and celebrating they're like well that fed my whole family for 40 years yeah so have a bit of respect i'm never surprised when board members don't vote to gut the thing that's going to provide income for their grandchildren for the companies they've been at their entire lives. Yep. Um, it seems to me that you're, you know, you went down there, realized you were a bit, <laughs> a bit mouthy. Yeah. Uh, and then created an opportunity for these people to transition to. Yeah. Well, I was, I was so headstrong about where I thought it was going. And, and I think 10 years later, I can say that it has gone in the Latrobe Valley the way I would have liked. Like the, the penetration of renewables has 
um, gone the way I would have hoped. Mm. You know, I remember one of my greatest victories in 2015, we put a 100 kilowatt system on the headquarters of Latrobe City Council. And then they put out a, a press release to say that we put solar on the roof to reduce our energy bills. Yeah. You know, and so for all the megawatts and megawatts of solar we've installed, that message of putting solar on the headquarters of Latrobe City Council and then them putting out a proactive press release to say they were doing it to lower their energy bills, I thought was a remarkable step forward. But it only came about because I was able to sit back and start to appreciate things from their perspective mm. and tell those stories about new apprentices and all those things that people love. Like a 19-year-old putting his uniform under his arm and heading off on his first day to start a career in renewable energy. Like everyone loves jobs and apprenticeships especially. Yeah. And so I learned to tell more of those stories and just lead by example rather than just trying to, you know, have a, a shouting match about whether coal or renewables was the future. Mm. And you're essentially the, the poster child for growing businesses that venture capitalists or investors want to come up and grab and scale. Um, How did you get to RACV? What's that? Well, we have had a few knocks on the door over the years, that's for sure. Um, you know, we never intended the business to get this big. We, we had a vision of, um, you know, it's, I know it's ridiculous to consider just looking after people, doing the right thing and delivering on what you promise and that sort of stuff. <laughs> but unfortunately, in the solar industry, um, we haven't seen that. We, you know, we probably have nearly a million systems now that are orphaned in Australia with no warranty support. And a lot of those were companies that would come along and offer a deal too good to be true strip out all the back-end costs, service and support and all those things. Uh, and then every three years, they just, you know, the ABN would shut down, another ABN would pop up, which sounds remarkably like the old one. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of examples of that across this industry. So once our business started growing off the honesty and integrity and all those values, it was amazing how quickly, you know, the venture capital companies and the growth funds and those types of things started to show interest in where we're going. Um, but, the, but the values just weren't aligned. There's just, there's no... Um, there's no common journey that we're on together and, and what we've created this business. Why do we do it? You know, what's our legacy? Um, and then RECV came along after we decided that we weren't for sale. Um, RECV came along and we were fortunate enough to win a tender to install solar across all of their resorts across Australia, about two megawatts of solar. And halfway through the contract, they called us and said, just want to talk to you about this, uh, about the, the, the relationship. I was like, Okay, everything okay? So yeah, everything's fine. Just come in for a chat. They want to make sure you're there for the warranty. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they just said, we're thrilled. We love everything about it. We love your values. You're perfectly aligned with what RECV um, is striving towards as a brand. Hmm. And then we want to talk about the relationship. And I started doing some research and I realized that they are the partner for us. They, mm-hmm. they talk about the member experience the same way that we talk about customer service. Hmm. There's so much alignment there. They've been around 117 years, 2 million plus members in Victoria. So they have a tremendous reach, obviously financially very strong, a whole bunch of subsidiary businesses underneath them now as well. But through all of that and all the you know, world wars and depressions and GFCs they've survived, their values are absolutely locked in and they were the same as they were in 1903. Mm. And um, you know, it, it's been remarkable to see that in action because businesses say we only care about looking after our client and then you go and talk in the boardroom and quite clearly it's not embedded in their DNA. Mm. It's absolutely embedded in RECV's DNA. So, being able to continue to put the customer first at the expense of short-term profit, it was, it was critically important for us. And you know, it's only six months, uh, six months tomorrow, actually, yeah. since the acquisition went ahead. Um, but the honeymoon period is still alive and well. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely loving it. New energy relationship I was talking to my partner about. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's right. What do you want out of the world? People are out there watching. Well, if, if someone is running a business or has a home that doesn't have solar, it, whatever their reluctance has been, I want them to reach out to us. So tell me why, why is it that you don't have solar yet? Is it because uh, they dropped the feed-in tariff? Is it because you don't own the building that you live in? Is it because you haven't got the capital to invest? You know, tell me what the barrier is mm. and I'll take the barrier down. There's, there's so much opportunity that exists out there, especially when it comes to businesses. So we've been able to make a business case for businesses that frankly could not care less about the environment. It just does not register the, to them at all. And they'll look you in the eye and say, we're going to do this if it saves us money. It's the only thing we care about. The, the beautiful thing about renewables now, including battery storage, that we can deliver a case like that for them. They just stacks up pure economics. Mm. And you know, the environmentalism for me, that's why I do what I do. But if people wanna have a discussion about economics, I'm happy to have that discussion as well. It just stacks up on every level. So it's, it's, it's tremendously exciting. In closing, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching. It's a real pleasure of mine to bring you this information and these videos and these interviews with wonderful 
humans like this creating change in the world. Um, I specialize in targeted video communication for impact investors and telling stories that matter. And the reason I'm making this sort of content is to lift the conversation that we're having because beyond the headlines, beyond the news and beyond the political sland, slander, there's a better story of humanity going on and you can lean into it as a business owner, as an individual, it's the time to get on board. So we're standing in a field of your creation from your vision in a small room. And um, congratulations and thanks for being on the show. It's been great to chat.